am I audible? Yes. And, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. So, can I continue? Yeah. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Manasa. So, so yeah. what? Uh, uh, what I was saying was that uh, in the early 19th century, when Braille came in, it opened the doors of education for uh, persons with blindness and low vision, and we could move into uh, livelihood opportunities where education played a huge role. And earlier than that, of course, the, the opportunities were very, very limited uh, since, the, since education was not there. But then uh, at the end of 20th century, another big uh, revolution happened uh, where uh, from the special script, which is required for our building our base in the education, which is Braille, we could actually start reading and writing in mainstream script, uh, which, and I'm talking about persons with blindness and low vision here. And uh, what it uh, really did was that, that it had an absolutely revolutionary impact on the disciplines uh, which are, uh, uh, in which we could get education or the livelihood opportunities. So, um, for example, in India, uh, we have uh, something called, uh, uh, you know, there's a quota system. There is a reservation for persons with disabilities uh, on, in, in government jobs. And there is a list of jobs which are on which such reservations, certain percentages of those uh, job vacancies are uh, reserved for persons with disabilities for recruitment. Now, this list got completely changed uh, in, uh, in mid 90s and early, early 2000, the first decade of uh, starting 2000 and 2010, a very big change came in this list because uh, now we had persons with blindness who could actually have written communication with the rest of the world. This happened because of the information technology uh, with the use of screen reading software and computers and smartphones we started reading and writing in the same script as everybody else. And, um, and, the, and the change uh, is, was so evident that before uh, this, this change was recognized in this list, the kind of jobs which were, uh, which were reserved for persons with uh, blindness or low vision were that of, uh, that did not require any written communication. Uh, you know, jo jobs like, uh, uh, railway announcers on, on railway stations or uh, telephone operators or any of those jobs which required speaking and listening uh, uh, as a mode of communication. And uh, uh, when this thing was recognized, uh, we, you know, all types of jobs got recognized and uh, the, the employment opportunities really the whole spectrum of uh, employment opportunities and livelihood or opportunities got opened, right from the clerical posts in the thing to becoming bank managers to being economists or um, you know the the personnel managers or finance managers to um, to the uh, you know even the the jobs which are most coveted most. Uh, uh, valued jobs of civil civil services the uh, the highest bureaucrats uh, the foreign services or the administrative services which are like uh, just about uh, you know 1000 people in uh, per year get selected to those jobs even there the job opportunities got opened for persons with blindness and low vision because this huge change has has happened um uh, the, uh, there are, uh, you know, just by bringing in the technology does not make changes. Uh, the, the ICT uh, becoming accessible uh, is just a beginning step because what also is required is that the ICT infrastructure has to be made compatible with the assistive technology. That's easier said than done because the accessibility guidelines, the accessibility standards, which have been put in place, uh, which are 
a norm uh, in many uh, uh, European or US, Canada, et cetera, high income group countries. In many of the developing countries, including India, it's, it's, a, it's a work which is not yet uh, completed. It's, uh, these kind of standards are being uh, uh, put through. One of the major, uh, uh, you can say, the policy which has worked as one of the best uh, policies to have these accessibility standards being adopted in the ICT infrastructure for the mainstream is the procurement policy, where uh, you know no government procurement uh, uh, can happen of goods which are actually not accessible or does not adhere to these accessibility standards. And for this thing to happen, first of all, the country has to recognize and adopt these standards which have uh, been uh, which have a proven track record of accessibility. Uh, uh, for example, in Europe, we have this EN 301549 um, uh, uh, procurement uh, standards in place, system in place. And uh, today itself in a meeting in India, uh, you know, uh, a strong recommendation of a task force of government has recommended that, the, that this European standard should also be uh, considered as an Indian standard with few additions uh, for specifically for Indian languages as our national uh, standard, which would be applicable for all the procurement for government. This is just a recommendation stage. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, I'm would you please unmute yourself? Sorry, I didn't realize when I got muted. Yeah, okay, um, yeah, you can carry on. Okay. So uh, one is this, uh, what I was actually talking about is one is that the ICT gaps have to be uh, fulfilled. First of all, these new technologies have to be uh, uh, identified. The procurement uh, policy has to be in place. Uh, the nations have to recognize the standards on which to base the procurement policy and then the capacity building of the users themselves at the right age uh, has to happen for this livelihood to happen in these areas. The, uh, uh, the, the, the trouble that happens is that people complete their education. In fact, we find cases where people complete their post-graduation and PhDs from universities without getting exposure to this uh, uh, you know, ICT tools and uh, adhere only to the old, uh, to the system of Braille only. And uh, if they do that, of course, these new opportunities, uh, they are not ready for these new opportunities. And what happens is that after completing their education, then there are employability trainings that they get into, and they are then given uh, trainings for computers or uh, you know, basic communication skills. Whereas uh, these things we have proven in our projects that if we start early, right from the age of almost class three, uh, you know, age of uh, seven or eight years, the ICT tools being deployed along with Braille to be able to give them the skills for reading and writing in the mainstream script also, that prepares them for really for this, uh, for this uh, new uh, job market that we are talking about. And then the gap between unemployable persons, educated persons with disabilities and the jobs vacancy going vacant. I mean, that, that's a paradox that happens because we have large number of people who are not employable in the current market and there are vacancies which go un, un, uh, you know, un, unfilled because there are uh, not adequately qualified and skilled people around. So this ICT adoption at the right age with the right policy, right procurement policy is really the way forward. It's easier said than done. It's a, it's a very hard work, uh, uh, which takes few years and a lot of advocacy to put together to actually make it a reality. Thank you so much. Back to you, Arifai. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dipendraji.
uh, is uh, you know uh, we can learn from you about like a, especially the South Asian uh, the context uh, you know as uh, around like last two decades uh, different organization including the government uh, we are trying to uh, you know the uh, develop the like a different accessible ICT ICTs and there are some uh, the individual efforts some the uh, combined efforts and uh, already there is a lot. Uh, there's so many positive things happening at the different level. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dipendra uh, Manocha, uh, for your sharing. So now I would like to uh, invite the second speaker, who uh, is uh, uh, Gunela Spring. Uh, she is the Vice President of Internet Society Accessibility uh, Special Interest Group. And uh, Ipsha, we are, uh, you know, one of the like a, uh, the uh, proud uh, uh, organization who got the fellowship from the Internet Society and we had a very close relationship. We are exchanging our information and knowledge. So today we will uh, listen to Gunilla about the like different innovations. So Gunilla, now uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, unmute. Yes. Oh. Thank you very much uh, for your introduction and, um, and your invitation for me to speak today. I'm very happy to be part of, um, of this presentation. And, uh, I, I was very interested to hear what Kendra said about um, accessibility criteria in public procurement. Uh, it is something I've, I've worked with for a number of years. And we advocated in Australia um, for that to be adopted uh, from the European standard. And we're fortunate now that there is an Australian standard um, on accessibility criteria in public procurement, but it needs to be used. And, uh, and I think that is a key to many policies. They actually need to be used and implemented in an effective manner. So, I, I wanted to just go straight into talking about um, employment uh, for persons with disability. And we, we know that it, uh, it, it getting a job um, is a key part of societal inclusion and accessibility to the digital workplace is vital. It's also important for social inclusion and economic independence. And employment contributes to physical and mental health and a sense of identity. And, and obviously it raises income, it, it raises living standards overall. And we also um, have a lot of documentation that uh, disability have lower absenteeism and often are more engaged and involved in the workplace. And that creation of workplace diversity um, can foster new ideas, in the innovation in how, in how um, a workplace operates and interaction between various people. So we, we should consider um, the, the high level policy and, and how and if it is used. So, Let's cascade down from the international to the local level. And I'm going to cover off a lot to do um, with Australian situation in, in, in this particular case. So we know about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. It's a key policy instrument that, for example, Australia has signed and ratified. And it means that the government needs to abide by it. And that's the case with any country. So um, the, the government and, and, and disability community provide a shadow report um, every few years. Article nine refers to ICT accessibility and, and this partly relates to accessible online government services. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in Australia, the Digital Transformation Agency provides guidelines um, I should also point out that in Australia, um, it's, it's a, a federation of various states and those states provide a range of services. So we have a national disability strategy 
that includes a digital information and communication technologies um, uh, objectives. And as well, um, both state governments um, have their own legislation. And I live in the state of New South Wales and there is a Disability Inclusion Act. And that means that all New South Wales government departments, some government agencies and all local councils are required to produce a disability inclusion action plan. So, and there's a section of that that um, involves digital inclusion. So I wanted to actually use um, a case study um, that is in my own local community in that is called the Byron Shire Council. And I'm part of an access consultative working group. And that, that comprises people with disability um, who have shown the way for staff to improve a wide variety of services in their local government area. And this includes the, the government, um, the, the, the council's website, which is accessible. Uh, so how is that process done? Well, the various sections of the council get direct advice from persons with disability um, on this uh, consultative access working group. And there is also an internal staff access group that's been formed to embed accessibility in everyday work. And that's led by a staff accessibility champion. So part of this is to provide online awareness training. And, and so it's not just some external group coming in and saying, um, we need to consider accessibility. While that's really important, and that's what we do, it also is continued through in the, the internal workings of the council. So for example, there's new staff, if they're hired such as web developers, they need to show they are familiar with web content accessibility guidelines 2.1. And obviously if more people with disability are part of a workplace, understanding will grow. And this attitude and approach can be adopted in many organizations. So it comes down to people. So using those policies and legislative instruments, that's one thing, but it shouldn't be just about ticking boxes. People need to understand why, why are they doing something in particular to increase accessibility? And that's when um, people have direct contact with persons with disability. And that makes a greater incentive. So for example, if they are content developers um, within an organization, and in this case, it's local government, and they're working alongside a blind person who is a staff member, who is using screen reading software and speech out court, they, they, really, they really think about how they design something and, and hopefully they won't forget those all tag descriptions on images on a website, for example. So um, it's one example, but um, there's, there's obviously a lot that needs to be done. And, and if we can just take positive steps in, you know, in the local government area and then drilling up to the, the state government and so on and so forth. Each of those steps hopefully will create better progress. So we've still got a long way to go. We all know that, but at least it's an example of what could happen. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gunilla. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the nice uh, the presentation by you and then uh, we are very happy that uh, you joined from Australia and also uh, shared uh, the, some of the, your experiences and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, how 
uh, the uh, the innovation and then uh, internet and also the uh, like a uh, AI can uh, the creating a, a, like a enabling environment at the different uh, work settings and also uh, how uh, how we can how we can uh, you know the, we can learn uh, uh, the from them. So thank you, thank you, Gunella. For that, uh, so uh, now I would like to invite the third speaker, uh, our mentor, and uh, since long we are working with uh, with him, the Hiroshi Kawamura san. Uh, he is the vice president of the Step Technology Development, uh, the organization at uh, from Japan, and uh, our organization, uh, you know, uh, just we honor him as like our one of philosopher, one of our guide actually who actually help us to start thinking about the uh, accessibility issue, thinking about to work on the ICTs and also help and also guide us. So we are grateful to him and also today he joined. So Kaomura san, I'm sure you are in the line because I'm not seeing you. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So, so the uh, floor is, floor is your, yeah. Kaomura san okay. will, will talk about the like international commitments and the barriers and also some of the like, uh, recommendation. So Kaumura san Okay, thank you very much uh, for um, yeah, very kind uh, introduction uh, uh, for me. And uh, it is my uh, great pleasure to uh, be invited and uh, share uh, my idea and uh, my experience uh, with all of you, um, in particular at the Zero Project. So I would like to start with uh, the, um, so back in uh, 2005, uh, when um, the United Nations uh, met in Tunisia, uh, in Tunis, at the um, World Summit on the Information Society, uh, when uh, the global uh, IT community uh, wanted to see the solution uh, for uh, to tackle the digital divide. And uh, the conclusion uh, was uh, really um, impacted on uh, the uh, CRPD, uh, in particular for the uh, ICT accessibility uh, contents of the CRPD. So if you uh, remember uh, the article two of the CRPD. Uh, it says accessible multimedia as one of the uh, communications uh, which is really accessible. And back in 2006, uh, almost nobody knows what is accessible multimedia. Um, now I would like to say that after uh, more than uh, 15 years, we are now uh, getting uh, the real uh, basics of the uh, accessible multimedia as an international standard. So I would like to share with you the fact that uh, the EPUB accessibility 1.0 becomes uh, the ISO standard. Uh, which is approved. And together with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, which is already uh, the ISO standard, uh, the uh, Web Accessibility and uh, the Electronic Publishing Accessibility uh, will get together to support uh, all people uh, to uh, exchange ideas, skills, knowledge and communications uh, on the, uh, how can I say, uh, recorded and sto storage basis, which is the very important foundation of the employment. So without a written manual, there is no tangible work. Um, with uh, the work, knowledge and information, we can accumulate 
um, our knowledge and the skills, and uh, even uh, the uh, communications and express the ideas and uh, the uh, good cultural works, etc. So, so all basics of the stored human knowledge is going to be accessible to be based on the international standard, which is identified as the ISO standard, uh, which will also impact on uh, the procurement process. The ISO standard is uh, the most important standard, uh, which uh, will be cited as uh, when the public procurement is conducted. So uh, there are international measures to follow uh, the existing international standard. So the ISO standard is one of those. So therefore, um, we are getting a very important tool to take advantage of the uh, ICT um, for the employment, education, and training, and other uh, human works. Um, from now on um, by implementing the international standard, which is just established. So um, we have a long way to go to, uh, for the implementation, um, but uh, we have a very good example, which is already, already implemented and which is the really uh, the solution of each individual's uh, participation in the society, including um, employment. Um, so DAISY network uh, in India and also in Bangladesh uh, strongly expanded and reaching to uh, the education in particular uh, from the basic education to the higher education uh, which will uh, cover uh, the uh, manuals that are necessary uh, to get employment and training within the job place. So the standard implementation uh, is a key uh, to get such a job place um, worldwide. Uh, regardless of the developing or already well developed. So um, the, uh, in Europe, um, with the European Accessibility Act, uh, which uh, will implement uh, such international standard, accessibility standard by year 2026 at the latest, and um, in other countries uh, like United States, etc., are already uh, starting to implement uh, the existing and forthcoming standard, uh, which is um, going to be the, uh, presenting the real accessible multimedia. So some of the key technologies which I would like to uh, draw your attention um, is um, in particular for the EPUB based access to the multimedia is the full synchronization of the contents, um, text graphics and uh, motion pictures in the near future so that uh, all accessible contents may um, serve at the same time for both blind people and deaf people. Currently, it is too difficult, but uh, um, in, based on the uh, synchronization technology to be developed uh, based on the EPUB accessibility, I expect that it will be done. And another um, key technology will be the multiple rendition of the EPUB, uh, which is uh, the um, uh, linkage between uh, the uh, fixed layout contents 
uh, which is uh, something very graphical, complicated uh, layout uh, with uh, the deflowable contents, uh, which is uh, the um, streamlined uh, reading contents, um, regardless of the uh, layout. So the multiple rendition is a key technology to um, bring those uh, presentations together. So then you can switch from one to another. So uh, with those uh, key technology components, I expect uh, the EPUB accessibility and web uh, contents accessibility will bring us a more um, inclusive employment environment. Um, so this is uh, based on the uh, EPUB-based future, uh, but uh, uh, there are yet another approach, which is the motion picture-based uh, approach for the accessible um, multimedia development. Um, I like to point out uh, two international standards, which uh, uh, one of them is the ITUT H.702 uh, for motion picture accessibility. And another one is the North American standard, which is the ATSC3. So those are the uh, multimedia, accessible multimedia uh, based on motion pictures. The merger uh, will soon uh, be um, coming uh, because of the pressure of the user group, those who require uh, such merger. So that is uh, the power of the people uh, with disabilities for the uh, inclusion, as well as uh, the uh, achievement of the sustainable development goals. And I think um, those key technologies will be uh, the uh, very important area of work of standard organization, such as Daily Consortium, W3C, um, ISO, uh, and uh, my own organization, Assistive Technology Development Organization. So um, I uh, shared with you about uh, the uh, key technology components, uh, which will give us the bright future of the ICT development. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Hiroshi Kaomura-san. And uh, you know, I'm sure the who are uh, listening and watching uh, this session will be very happy, you know, uh, to have these uh, innovations in our hand. And, uh, and also we are very happy that the uh, different innovations are uh, happening in the different parts of the world and uh, hopefully it will be uh, useful for us uh, and also to make us, our people more accessible so that they can enter in a, um, in a, in a, in a better life. So thank you, thank you, Kamara-san. So now I would like to invite the, our next speaker, uh, she, uh, Yulia uh, Sorviro. Uh, she is the senior project manager of uh, Smart Cities for uh, All uh, Initiative, uh, Z3ICT, uh, which is stand for the Global Initiative for Inclusive ICTs. So Yulia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Arifur. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this uh, session. Um, let me briefly describe myself for those who can see me. I'm a 40 year old uh, white woman with short blonde hair. Today I'm wearing the uh, dark blue turtleneck and uh, two quarts uh, pullover. Um, I, I'm representing the uh, Global Initiative on Inclusive ICTs and as it derives from our name, the organization was created to promote digital inclusion and ICT accessibility for persons with disabilities and uh, for older persons. Uh, we are implementing lots of different projects in different industries to add the focus on accessibility and inclusion uh, when companies, countries and cities are developing or deploying technologies. 
we uh, are firmly stand on the on the point that uh, those new technologies should not discriminate persons with disabilities and that uh, they should benefit actually those uh, persons um, today there are a lot of discussions around the future of the uh, work in general how the work uh, market will look uh, tomorrow, what will be the new requirements, what will be the new professions, new industries, and what are the skills that uh, people will need to succeed in this new uh, reality. However, today we would like to um, speak about a more uh, specific field, which is actually uh, the workplace of the future. And uh, as with the uh, work market in general, we see uh, quite a lot of transformations in the field of workplaces. And um, to meet the pace of uh, change, the workplaces of the future um, should uh, uh, provide greater creative collaboration. Uh, they should focus on well-being on focus in a more significant scale uh, on the well-being of the employees. Uh, they uh, should also provide more opportunities uh, for people to be connected and uh, given the uh, our reality today uh, to be connected in more than one place simultaneously. Uh, today workplaces uh, deploy quite a lot of technologies uh, to support a broad, broad range of critically important services, um, to deploy the new products and services. But uh, we still believe that there are quite a lot of uh, additional things that could be done to make this work even more efficient. Uh, this COVID-19 situation, this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, became actually an accelerant for workplace transformation. Uh, it is the first time in the history when in, in such a short period of time, such a condensed period of time, uh, there were so many uh, um, changes uh, in, in how people work. Uh, so many uh, services and so many activities were um, transferred to remote form uh, to the virtual form. And uh, at the same time, this is the first time when technology merges the talents of employees in a manner that is more adaptable, human-centered, and inclusive. Uh, at the same time, today, it is not fully clear um, how much uh, focus and how much access, uh, how much uh, attention is given to the uh, uh, accessibility and inclusion uh, when uh, companies create, design, and implement the new leading edge uh, workplaces. Uh, given that the, there are more than 1 billion people uh, with disabilities around the world, um, it is critically important for economic uh, forces to take uh, accessibility and inclusion into consideration when deploying these new workplaces of the future. Um, these workplaces should be a compelling destination for every member of the team, of the company, organization, governmental body, city, or any other institution. Uh, so that uh, those uh, people can contribute to their prosperity, to the success of their employer and their own success, uh, not despite their unique identities, but because they are all unique and they are all provided with uh, equal opportunities and equal access to information, to multimedia, uh, to all the tools that people can use to succeed. Um, we believe that workplaces of the future should meet three criteria. Uh, they should be safe, they should be compelling, and they should be inclusive. Um, and uh, when we say inclusive, we mean that those workplaces actually meet the broad range of user needs. 
And uh, we are not speaking only about persons with disabilities. We are speaking about everybody. Because as we all know, uh, disability can be situational or permanent. But at any point of the time, any of us can have any troubles or barriers uh, with accessing to technology. And uh, given the role of technologies in the modern world, we cannot allow uh, these areas to sustain. Uh, we know that uh, uh, technologies at the workplace are not only about uh, those uh, applications or services that are installed on the laptops or computers of the employees of any organization. We're talking about more comprehensive IT systems. And uh, given that uh, uh, workplace is something that not only remote, uh, but it also something in the offices. Uh, there are quite a lot of activities that the companies will need to take to uh, make the offices, the buildings more accessible, uh, not only from the physical standpoint, but also from the technology standpoint. And there are so many uh, technologies nowadays that uh, can help to do that, um, to reduce the year touch uh, interfaces to uh, reduce, uh, to, to Im implement or deploy the voice uh, activated services and so on. Uh, to uh, elaborate a bit more on the workplace of the future, G3 ICT uh, is working currently on the new project with Steelcase. Uh, to create the blueprint for inclusive workplace of the future. And this document uh, will contain key principles of more inclusive workplaces, what more inclusive workplace actually means. Uh, they will, this document will give the good practices for mainstreaming accessibility into digital transformation activities that many companies are going through right now. And uh, we hope to provide insights for designing and implementing those safe, compelling, and inclusive workplaces. Uh, we expect that this work would be of interest for any individuals or organizations that would like to add the focus on uh, inclusivity into their transformation activities. Uh, and in particular, I would say that um, uh, this might be useful for senior executives who elaborate, implement, and approve the uh, policy documents, strategies for the companies or organizations. It is definitely something that should be of interest for human rights, uh, uh, human, excuse me, human resources practitioners, for hiring managers, uh, but also, of course, to technologists to IT architects, but at the same time, as we're speaking about offices, uh, office buildings, we should remember that uh, we need to engage architects and office space designers when we're discussing how the future of workplace will look like. Uh, of course, this work cannot be done uh, without the disability and human rights advocates. And uh, of course, there are a lot of academics uh, working nowadays in this field. And uh, we think that it is very important to engage academics as well. Uh, this work, this project that we are going to implement and are starting doing that right now will, uh, in our expectation, serve as the foundation for future progress. Based on this work, uh, uh, other organizations can create specific workplace scenarios. Can be derived from the principles of inclusive workplace. And finally, uh, these uh, principles could serve for the future assessment and benchmarking of their uh, inclusivity, inclusiveness uh, of the workplaces.
uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you, our report. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Yulia. Very nice uh, deliberations on ICT and employment uh, in light of the disability inclusion and accessibility. So thank you. And also, we wish also good luck for this uh, initiative. And uh, you know, the IPSA has uh, involved uh, through the Bashkar about the uh, Smart Cities for All initiative in Bangladesh. And hopefully it will be a very popular in this campaign and in this work in, in, a, in our country also. So thank you and we'll see you again. Eh? And now our last speaker, Mr. Bhaskar, actually, who is the nucleus of this program? You know, uh, Bhaskar is uh, last two decades, he's working with IPSA and uh, uh, last few years, he's working with the Bangladesh government as a uh, national consultant for accessibility uh, for a 2 a program under the ICT division uh, uh, of Bangladesh government. So I'm inviting Bhaskar to uh, you know, to share some of his thoughts uh, and especially the contextual analysis of this region. And uh, he's the actually right person from our country to talk about the uh, ICT and disability issues, ICT and accessibility issues. And you know, and there are many uh, good results already uh, established in our country, and there are many practices. At the same time, still there are many barriers and challenges. So I'm inviting Bashkar to talk. So Bhaskar, um, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Arifur Oman. And ladies and gentlemen, today I'm very excited to be here, especially I'm seeing all of my favorite personality here. Number of people with disabilities have joined here, represented by D DPOs, different NGOs, um, INGOs, journalists. Thank you very much for joining. And we are seeing that Zero Projects channel are uh, um, here on our program and also many uh, number of Facebook pages, including Ipsha and others are uh, live now. Many people are was watching us. And, you know, um, I like to share some of my personal experience first. My life was changed uh, through a dream initiative by Duskin. That was Duskin leadership training in 2002. Before that, even I never ever thought I can use any technology or I can use any computer or I can get a good job in any good place. My dream was very narrow. So Duskin leadership training was the key in my life. So for a employment, skill development is highly important for a person with disabilities. Then another point came, after return from Japan, I thought I have learned a lot. I, now I can contribute for my country. But nobody believed that a blind people can contribute, can work, can perform, can engage, can innovate. I was jobless at least one year. So Mr. Arif is the person and IPSA is the organization who have given me the opportunity in 2004 to work with them with a small initiative. Then. All the international fellows, my mentors, Hiroshi Kawamura, Dipendro Ji, and etc., have supported us. And today, we are the model for GLOBE that making information accessible, making service accessible. Later, I have started work with the Prime Minister Office of Bangladesh. Believe me, they have designed an interview such a way that they can recruit me. So positive discrimination is highly important for creating employment for people with disabilities. I am seeing three challenges in our region for creating employment for, for persons with disabilities. One is the one biggest barrier is accessibility. Our employment issues when there is address, when employers are ready to welcome us, but their infrastructure are not accessible. The information are not accessible. Even we people with disabilities are unable to apply because of the um, uh, inaccessible recruitment process. The website softwares are not accessible. So that's why we are excluded. And number of people with disabilities, youth with disabilities are not getting opportunity to work. As you know, Yulia mentioned, one billion people in the world are people with disabilities and we are the largest minority. And each of us have diverse accessibility needs. That's why um, uh, we need to work uh, in a universal design model. 
many organizations may be considered accessibility, but they are not universally designed. So uh, all types of people with disabilities are not enjoying them. Another challenge is the acceptance. One of the biggest challenges for people with disabilities is that employers are not accepting us as an active employee. Many INGOs, NGOs working on disabilities are not considering us as expert. We are seeing many, many um, uh, projects, disability projects are implemented by the non-disabled people. Corporates are not re really accepting us. That's why we are just ignored and excluded. Another biggest issue is the awareness. We know our ability. People with disabilities are equally able than other. Today, I read my newspaper through my smartphone when a non-disabled people may read this, his newspaper through, a, through, through taking on hand. So we are equally able to perform, engage, and do everything, whatever, by using technology such as computer, screen reading software, smartphone, braille display, screen magnifier, many other technology and innovation. But um, people have no awareness on, on that. Still, there is not many models are created in our region to say the corporates to um, influence the government for recruiting the people with disabilities. But I don't want to be frustrated. Last 12 years, Bangladesh government recruited the highest number of people with disabilities, which was not happened in last 40, decade, uh, 40 years. At same time, we are seeing large number of people with disabilities are now jobless because of the government's very positive initiative to promote the education. We are seeing many, many graduate master's degree holders are now coming forward. But the, one of the difference is that in my time, there was no technology. Nowadays, they're getting a smartphone, computer, every types of technology on their hand. Even though it is not affordable, sometimes expensive, but many non-government organizations like IPSHA is donating. Government like ICT division have a scheme for promoting computer and they are running number of skill development programs for creating employment. They are organizing job fair and they are making e-learning platforms such as Muktopat, et cetera. Again, there is a challenge. The platforms, technology sometimes not accessible. We are working hard to make it more accessible and inclusive. Today, I'd like to take an opportunity to say a big thank you to Zero Project, who are, whose dream is no barrier, zero barrier for this world. We want a better world. I was engaged last half decade with Zero Project Initiative and many, many um, innovation they have recognized and introduced uh, a local level to international level. So we are grateful to you, sir, for giving us opportunity to speak here. And I want to complete my speech as I, we want to listen some of our participants as we need to complete this session by five. And thank you very much, Lotta. I think you are um, uh, translating in sign language. And thank you all for listening us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Baskar. Actually, uh, we are uh, very close to end. Uh, so thank you uh, to all the speakers and the listeners. And we got some uh, uh, remarks and some questions in our chat box. So as the time is very limited, we are not uh, able to respond all, but uh, you know, uh, surely this is like a, a beginning. Uh, Jiro projects gave us a scope to share our, uh, the listen uh, our speakers and also uh, develop a network among us and uh, uh, you know, it's a, though there is a many challenges on, uh, especially in the uh, workplace, uh, at the workplace for the persons with disability, but also there are many good practices happening in the different parts of the world and we can learn from each other and, and we can share our knowledge and we can share our innovations. So through this way, uh, slowly, all the barriers will be overcome and we are very optimistic. Uh, one day there will be a zero barrier for any uh, uh, all walks of life. So, and then ICT can help us to overcome it. So thank you again uh, to the Juro projects and all the speakers and also special thanks to the sign language interpreter, Ms. Arafat Sultana Lata and Ipsha team actually who worked behind this and uh, make it happen. 
So, so uh, with this, I would like to conclude this session. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.